G'day, I'm Scott Poynton and welcome to another podcast. And in this podcast, I want to talk a bit about climate change. Not all the science behind it and uh, all the impacts that it's having. I'm sure we'll touch on that a little bit. But I keep getting asked by friends, by professional colleagues, what can I do? What can I do about climate change? What action can I take? Sometimes there's a we in there. What action can we take? How can we help? What can we do? But it's a question I get asked a lot. People know that I'm working on this. And uh, and so I thought rather than just go one on one and one, you know, talk to one person here, one person there, I can make a podcast because perhaps you out there, the listener, uh, you all have questions too, perhaps about how you can take action. This last week, really the last week, very intensely, but even where I live here in Switzerland, we, we haven't had a decent rain here for maybe three weeks and it's been hot. I'm sure people here in Europe, but Australia, America, all around the world, wherever you are, you've probably been hearing news about this heat wave that's engulfing Europe. Just earlier this week, the UK recorded its first ever day above 40 degrees Celsius. And these are lethal temperatures. These can kill people. And when we do have these heat waves, it, it's pretty serious. And far from being just a one-off occurrence, we're getting them pretty much every year now. And something like the hottest 20 years on record in the planet have been the last 19. So climate change is here. Climate change is here now. It's not something that's going to come in the future that we need to think about because humans, we're not very good at looking too far ahead. We're really paying attention to what's happening in this moment, you know, making sure we've got food on the table tonight. And that's very logical. I'm not being critical about that. We have to you know, get kids to school, get kids through university. We have to do our job, live our life, be with our friends, make sure everything's going okay, make sure we're, our health is okay. So these are justifiable, immediate concerns. But climate change has moved from that distant sort of unknown time to be in our face right now. The heat wave is here. Uh, it was here last year. We're seeing massive floods all around the world. We're seeing incredible fires at times of the year when they shouldn't be happening. The environment is under great, great stress. And, and this is impacting our lives. It's impacting crop yields all around the world as rains fall in different ways, different times, as, 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 as temperatures just go much higher than crops can cope. So I keep saying to people, and forgive me for my language, but I say, we are in the poo. We are in deep poo. Climate change is upon us. And, and some people say, oh, yes, it's too late. What can I do? The other thing that a lot of people do is they, they like to blame others. Oh, it's the oil companies. Oh, it's the government who hasn't taken action. As if when something goes wrong, we need someone else to blame and someone else to fix the problem for us. And of course, there's an element of that. Uh, we do need governments to take action. Um, but I think that when we blame others for things, we tend to abrogate our responsibility for the thing that is bad. But even worse, we give up our agency, our ability to, to act, to fix it. When we say climate change is, is because of the oil companies and the government, it means that I can sit here on my sofa and, and I don't have to do anything because they are the ones that caused it and they are the ones that fixed it. Those people over there, them. It's someone else's fault. Therefore, what can I do? Okay, now, and I see this all the time and, and really great people posting on social media, oh, it's the oil companies and it's the government. And, and then I think, well, yeah, look at what's happening in the US right now with uh, the price of petrol at the, at the petrol pump. Um, everyone's going crazy. And, and look, also the other thing I, I, I say to people is like not a lot of people living in grass huts in the US or in America or in Australia and developed countries all around the world. And that's because we have profited from the energy that we've had from fossil fuels. And, and so the petrol companies, yes, I know they've behaved badly. I'm not letting anyone off the hook here. But far from pointing the finger at those, those companies, uh, you know, Exxon, Total, all the big you know, BP, Shell, yes, we know, and there's plenty of evidence that they have behaved badly in their pursuit of fossil fuels. But hey, we bought them. Uh, and we pay, to, we pay high prices for them too. And we're happy that governments subsidise them. And when that goes badly, as we saw also recently in Sri Lanka, then we riot and we're not very happy about it. We, and in Western democracies, we kick out governments that take action on these things that means that our hip pocket is damaged. And yet here we are today with a massive heat wave. Okay, So it's, I, I just wanted to mention that because I feel that when we blame others, we take away our agency. And in this podcast and in all the work that I'm doing, it's about us taking our own action, our agency, putting in place our agency and saying, 
we can each do something. And on the face of it, a small, you know, some of you may have heard the, the, the story about the hummingbird and Wangari Matai, the Nobel Peace Prize winner from Kenya, um, used to talk about this you know, African fable where there was a big fire in the forest and the elephants and the lions and the antelope, the zebras, the giraffe, they were all watching this fire burn the forest. And the little hummingbird came with a drop in its beak and flew over the fire and dropped that drop of water on the fire and flew back past all the watching animals to the water, the lake, and picked up another drop of water in its little beak and came and dropped that. And after a few times, all the animals said, what are you doing? What are you doing? You you can't, you're not putting out the fire. You can't make a difference. And the little hummingbird said, well, I'm doing what I can do. I'm doing what I can to make a difference. And I always found that very inspiring. And, um, you know, I'd like to hope that the work that I've done has all been about having a go. And I think that I think that we can all do our little bit like the hummingbird. If we all did things, we could all make some sort of impact. And and even if we even if we don't make a huge collective impact, but actually I think we can, but even if we don't, then it shows to governments, it shows to companies that we care about these things. And we're seeing that now with governments in some parts of the world being pressured by voters to take action on climate. We saw it in Australia recently after many, many years of terrible government inaction there and terrible fires and terrible floods. And so we are seeing voters saying to governments, we need to take action on this. And I think that companies are seeing this in the young people who are coming, the so-called Gen Zers, who are coming into the workforce, who are coming in as consumers. Companies are understanding that if we're going to attract those bright young things into our company to work for us, we need to show that we understand that climate change, environmental destruction, human rights, a whole range of issues are important to us too. Some companies fall into this bad habit, I think it is, of just doing some greenwashing marketing. But the the young people in particular are becoming very wise to that. And they can smell the old BS a long way away. And so they're really asking companies to demonstrate to them very clearly what their strong actions are. So if you work for a company and you're listening to the podcast here, really look at your actions and say, look, are we really doing something or are we just doing a lot of hot air and talking and actually contributing to the problem? Okay, so I think the pressure is building to do something. Some people say, oh, it's too late. And and I always say to people, look, if you don't take action, on climate change, if no one takes action on climate change and we just carry on the way we are, I think we can be absolutely certain without any question that it's going to end badly. It will end badly. Climate change will run away from us and and we face, you know, risks of 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 absolute huge scale. And and you know, even climate scientists now in muffled voices, some of them, and even more louder voices now from some of the more courageous are talking about the possibility of human extinction. And they talk about this term in the, I-N-T-H-E, in the, inevitable near-term human extinction. It's scary. It's deeply scary, okay? Societal collapse. If we don't get in the human extinction, we're looking like a pretty good bet to have societal collapse. Right? And the young people read these things and they can see these things coming. So if you care about your kids, if you care about the future of the planet, even if you care about how you're going to live today because it's 40 degrees outside when the long-term average is 23, you're suffering, your, your garden is suffering, your pets are suffering, old relatives are suffering. All of these things are here with us today and I believe we've got to take action because we can be certain if we don't that we're going to keep going on the path towards very, very, very deep poo. The counter to that is if we do take action, we don't know if it's going to make a huge impact. We can't be sure. And so some people say, well, I can't be sure, therefore I'm not going to do anything. Well, hold on, hold on, hold on. If you don't do anything, we can be sure. If you do nothing, we can be sure that we may face dire consequences to the point of human extinction. Okay, so we can be sure of that. If we do take action, we can't be sure it's going to be enough. So we ask ourselves, well, what what can we do? How far can we go? And of course, some people can go further than others. Some people have money to put solar panels on their roof, to change their electricity system, to move away from fossil fuels, to perhaps travel less, to eat less meat, 
they have opportunities to, you know, just do simple things in their house because maybe they've got more money and they can spend it. But climate change hits the poor, worst of all, because, you know, they are the most vulnerable. And, you know, it, it really calls on us, those of us with extra money, to perhaps take a bit more action because the poor who are going to get smashed by climate change, and I'm seeing that in my work, particularly in Africa, in the northern regions of Ghana, in the very dry savannah regions bordering the, the African Sahel, communities there are suffering massively because the rains are messed up, the temperatures are going up, they're having trouble growing their crops, and, and they do live in grass huts, and they are hugely vulnerable. So there's much that we all can do. And again, it comes back to, oh, you know, why would I do something to help someone else? Well, you're not. You're doing something to help yourself, your children, uh, your community. So that's my take on it. We, we may not know if what we do is enough, but we can be sure that if we do nothing, that we're in deep poo. So I like to encourage people to do things. And to that end, I, I set up a foundation, the Pond Foundation, and a program called My Carbon Zero to help people understand. So what's my contribution to this problem? And the easiest way to work that out is to work out how many tonnes of carbon you've emitted into the atmosphere over the course of your life. Not just this year, you'll hear companies talking about offsetting. And that means how many tonnes of carbon have I emitted this year? Let's reduce it by a little bit and let's invest in some other projects somewhere else to, to offset that. 99 times out of 100, that's greenwashing nonsense. And it's been going for 20 plus years and emissions are still rising dramatically. So I looked at that and I said, well, we need to do something different. We need to do something that's strong and credible and has a chance to move the needle on carbon emissions. We're, we're way above uh, the limits where we need to be and pre-industrial levels. We're, we're at 420 parts per million. And, and the scientists say, if we get to 450, uh, we're in a lot of trouble. Well, we're, we're in a lot of trouble now with the floods and the fires and the heat waves that we're experiencing and ex emissions that are accelerating. So what does credible climate action look like? What can you do? So first step, is to work out. If you want, you don't have to, you can just dive straight in and start taking actions. We'll come to that sort of list of actions in a minute. But some people like to say, right, how much have I contributed to the problem? And so you can go to the Pond Foundation website and I'll, I'll it's just the pondfoundation.org. You look up our My Carbon Zero program and there's a little calculator there that will take you somewhere between two and five minutes to work out what your lifetime carbon balance is based on where you've lived over the course of your life. Okay, and you'll get a number. And with that number, you'll know that, and, and for, so for example, in my case, I've lived in Australia many years where we burn coal for electricity, certainly in Victoria where I grew up, and, and that means that I have a very high lifetime carbon balance of 520 tonnes. Well, if you're in the US, it's usually a bit higher, or if you've lived all your life in Australia, mine would be higher too, but I've lived more than half of my life outside of Australia in countries with much lower emissions. So I'm 520 tonnes. So what can I do? What can I do with that? So here's what we, we did with My Carbon Zero. We said, right, imagine a big bathtub, a big bathtub of water, and we've all got a tap that's putting water into that bathtub. And right now it's about hmm, maybe three quarters full. And our taps are going pretty hard and the bathtub's filling up. Well, that bathtub, think of that bathtub as the atmosphere. Okay, and, and our taps are our emissions, how much carbon we put up into the atmosphere every year. And, and we, we put up a lot more if we burn fossil fuels for our energy, for example, if we eat a lot of meat, if we travel a lot, if we have a lot of food waste, uh, how we heat our home, all of these things can impact how much carbon each of us puts up into the atmosphere every year. So we've all got our tap flowing in there. And people in Africa who are also creating carbon emissions, but they've got a drip drip from their tap. And, you know, my tap's going, when I'm living in Australia, it's going full bore. When I'm living in the US, very high emissions in those countries, it's going pretty hard, filling up that bath pretty quickly. Okay, companies have got taps, governments have got taps. So what can we do? Well, first thing is we can turn the tap down. We can never turn it off completely, right? Because we're always going to create carbon emissions just by getting up and breathing each day and eating food. There's you know, it's taken carbon emissions to grow that food, right? So heating our house or cooling our house or using electricity in our house, um, there will be carbon emissions, right, from all of these things. If we drive a car, even electric vehicles, there'll be carbon emissions generated from the manufacture of those vehicles. So we, we cannot get our carbon emissions to zero, but we can reduce it. We can get it lower. 
So we can look at how, what energy do we use? Is it possible to put, get renewable energy? How much of it do we use? How much do we travel? What do we eat? You know, if we eat meat five times a week and we'd reduce that to four times a week, we'll reduce our food-related emissions by about 20%. There's huge emissions from uh, growing cattle and lamb and um, well, particularly cattle, but you know, a lot of emissions from growing meat to eat. So if we reduce our meat intake, we can reduce our carbon emissions. If we have food waste, huge emissions from food waste. So what, what can we do about food waste? What can we do about the way we travel? So there's a whole list of things, and th that's just touching on a few. But, you know, what lights do we use? Uh, even if we pump up our tyres on our car to the correct amount, we're going to use less fuel as we drive. So there's lots of things we can do. And on the Pond Foundation website, we've got some information there about that. Okay, so that's what we call our first action. And we call it R1, reduce. The first R. R1 is reduce your emissions. So basically turn your tap down. So you're putting less water into the bath, i.e. less carbon into the atmosphere. That's the first thing you can do. What's the second thing you can do? So the second thing you can do is to help others reduce their emissions. Others who perhaps don't have the same capacity, the same incomes as we do. So how do we help others to reduce their emissions? How do we help them turn their tap down? And there are projects and there are actions that you can invest in to do that. And this is traditionally where offsetting comes in. And what's different between My Carbon Zero, the Pond Foundation's program, My Carbon Zero, and traditional offsetting is we don't let you, when you do an R2 action to help someone else reduce their emissions, we don't let you take that off your balance sheet. Because you've still got, in my case, I've still got 520 tonnes of carbon up into the atmosphere. Now, because of my R1 actions, where I'm reducing how much carbon I put into the air every year, the average person here in Switzerland, where I live, emits about six to seven tonnes. But because I'm vegetarian, because um, we've got uh, an air pump for our house, uh, for our electricity and our water heating, because I, we have an electric car, because I travel less than what I've done in the past, I'm probably about two or three tonnes of carbon a year. So each year, it goes up by about two or three tonnes not six or seven. So that's great. But I've still got that carbon in the atmosphere. So no matter what I do to help someone else reduce their carbon through my R2 actions, reducing emissions elsewhere, it doesn't affect my 520 plus tonnes. Right? So this is where offsetting is nonsense. I've still got carbon going up into the atmosphere and I'm pretending that by helping someone else remove them, I can take that carbon off my balance sheet. Your bank manager wouldn't let you do it. Your accountant wouldn't let you do it with your money. So we shouldn't let people do that with carbon. And unfortunately, that's what offsetting does. It's nonsense, right? But we still want to encourage people to do that. If you've got the capacity to help others turn down their tap, we should do it. And so one of the examples, one, one of the things you can do, for example, is to help protect forests. Because if forests burn, they will put up a lot of emissions into the atmosphere. Another way is to support girls' education in the developing world. The average girl in some countries, you know, might have 10 children. If you can give them an education, there's great evidence that they can get a job, they have greater uh, power over their own lives, and they might only have two children. So that difference is a, a lot of carbon emissions avoided by bringing more kids into the world. It's a bit controversial. People say you shouldn't do that. But it's not family planning. It's giving girls in the developed world an education so they can have greater control over their lives. That's not a bad thing. One of the consequences of that is fewer babies. That's a good thing. Fewer call on resources on the planet. So that's R2. There's a lot of other things you can do on R2, but that's some examples. We've got more on the Pond Foundation website. Now, the big thing that we want people to do then is to remove. We call it R3, remove. R1, reduce your own emissions. R2, help other people reduce their emissions. And R3, remove your carbon from the atmosphere. So in my case, it's 520 tonnes plus two or three tonnes every year. So I'm probably at, you know, at about 526 tonnes now because I worked that out a couple of years ago. But what I'm doing now is investing in projects that support nature-based solutions to take carbon out of the atmosphere. So what does that mean? So yes, tree planting. If you plant trees, they will grow and they will take carbon out of the atmosphere. They will sequester carbon out of the atmosphere. That's great. You can support soil carbon projects where farmers, for example, adopt regenerative practices. They might not till the land. And when they do plough the land or till the land, uh, it turns the soil and releases a lot of carbon. So what can we do to support farmers to implement different agricultural practices that conserve carbon in the soil? 
What can they do in terms of composting, for example, to get carbon back in the soil? These are soil carbon projects. There's another fantastic opportunity in what we call biochar, where agricultural waste is treated through this process of pyrolysis, which basically means to burn it in limited oxygen. It's the same as making charcoal, but just with agricultural waste. And it's very stable. The resultant biochar is a great soil amendment, um, and you put it in the soil and it'll stay there for at least 100 years. So you're locking away carbon for at least 100 years. Because one of the problems with tree planting and, and soil carbon is that you can plant trees, but they may die, or they may live and then a fire comes along or it just gets so hot that they can't survive. Or the people who planted them decided that they actually need that field for agriculture and they pull the trees out or they chop them down. And soil carbon's the same. A farmer who adopts a process of getting carbon back into the soil through different practices can later change her mind or his mind and say, actually, you know what? We need to go back to traditional practices for whatever reason. So they're low durability solution, whereas biochar is what we call a medium durability solution. So investing in biochar projects costs a bit more, but it's terrific because it helps farmers improve the quality of their soil and at the same time takes a lot of carbon out of the atmosphere. Okay. The other things you can do, for example, is built environment projects where carbon is put, you know, for example, we, we're supporting a project in Italy uh, where a company there takes uh, rice straw and rice husk that would either be burnt after the processing process, and they're putting it into building materials and locking it away in buildings. Okay, so you're taking carbon out of the atmosphere, carbon that would otherwise have rotted and gone back up into the atmosphere, it's going into buildings. Okay, so this is great. So you can do a whole range of things, and again, we've got some projects there on our website that people can support. Um, and through that, for example, I've invested in the biochar projects and tree planting projects, and now my carbon balance is down to 325 tonnes. So I feel pretty good about that. And I've got some more investment that I need to do to get that down to zero and even negative. Right? So these are the things that we can do. And the, the last thing that we can do, so we talk about three R's, which is R1, reduce your emissions, R2, reduce, help others reduce their emissions, R3, remove carbon from the atmosphere. The last action is I, inspire other peoples to travel this journey with us. It's a bit like the little hummingbird. If it's only one, yeah, we might not get very far. But if you can inspire other people, people in your family, people in your work, inspire your company to take this action, to turn down their tap, because companies have a big impact. If we can inspire companies on this journey, we can increase our impact and we might get ourselves to a critical scale. But the key thing is acting, is taking steps. And I talk to people about this. They say, what can I do? And I tell them, oh, great, great. And they go to the website and they work out their carbon footprint, but that's when it stops. Because at that point, they've got to put their hand in their pocket and actually start paying some money to take action. And that's when it stops. And that's when it's, oh, it's the government's fault. Oh, it's the you know oil company's fault. Oh, it's this company's fault or that company's fault. They use a lot of carbon. Let them take action. And here we are today, heading for the abyss, a possible abyss of extinction, and certainly in deep poo with massive heat waves all around the world, fires, floods, storms, Lots of bad things happening. So that's that's how we can each take climate action. I'll put the website, the, the URL for the Pond Foundation in the notes here. I encourage you to have a look. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm not pushing that. I'm just sort of gentle suggestion that if you really want to do something, if you really want to take action, you've got to take steps. You've got to do something. And you can. There's so many easy things you can do to reduce your emissions. And actually, when you reduce your emissions, you generally save money because you're buying less energy, for example. You're traveling less. Okay, You're not buying petrol. You're not paying for electricity because you've got solar panels on your roof or you've got wind. Okay, So you actually save yourself some money. And that can free up money to invest, for example, to remove carbon from the atmosphere, to get yourself down to zero. My aim is that when I finally check out of the planet, I can look and say, you know what? I've taken all my carbon out of the atmosphere and I've helped others to do the same. And I think if we do that, we can make an impact. Okay, so the pondfoundation.org, my carbon zero program, um, have a look at it, see if you can take some steps yourself to be that hummingbird. And you might just inspire the giraffe and the lion and the elephant, and the zebra, and lots of other people, your family, your mates, your company to do the same. Goodness knows we need it. We've got to take some credible action soon. And I hope that uh, 
through this podcast, we've just helped you understand a little bit more that yes, we can each do something. And we've got to move beyond this question of blaming others and take our action. We've got to keep our agency. Hope that helps. If you've got any questions uh, as a result of the, the podcast, do send me uh, an email. My email is just scott at thepondfoundation.org. Um, if you want to learn more about what we're doing or how you can take action, drop me a line. And I'd also say, if there's other broader questions on sustainability that you're, you're interested in, if you'd like to hear more about some of the work that I or other people are doing, also drop me a line. Let me know. Ask me a question, and I'll make it the subject of a future podcast. Until then, good luck.